بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Distinguished elders and scholars, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, assalamu alaikum. Wow. We've really hit the big time, yeah? How wonderful, though unnoticed by the mainstream media, much of which seems to be owned by your former compatriot, Mr. Murdoch, that so many hundreds, indeed, now the second time in a week, more than 1,000 people in this great city of Sydney in New South Wales have gathered together for the second time now here in this magnificent auditorium to discuss the real politics. Not the politics that I've been listening to on Australian television and listening to on Australian radio, petty fogging xenophobia about asylum seekers and how to stop the boats, spoken by a, <laughs> spoken by a man who came here on a boat, incidentally. <laughs> Just as well they didn't stop the boats then or setting up inquiries into corruption in their own party over which they've presided for many years about money and brown paper parcels changing hands between property developers and local politicians. No, these are the real political issues, the big political issues that you have gathered here in such numbers for the second time in a week here in Sydney to discuss. I promised myself that I would not intrude too deeply into Australian politics, largely because I didn't want to be stopped at the border. <laughs> but now that I'm here and this is the second and final meeting, perhaps I shall allow myself just a little license. I'm here. I'm here in part canvassing for votes, not for myself, but I want to remind you that in the Senate elections forthcoming here in this state, you have the possibility of casting a vote which will affect international politics at the highest level. If you elect Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, as senator for New South Wales, you will cause absolute chaos in the British and American governments. And wouldn't that be a fine thing? Wouldn't it be a fine thing to have the British and American governments waiting anxiously by the telephone for the results of the count because as events just yesterday in the hijacking of the presidential aeroplane of the great president of Bolivia Evo Morales make clear this is an era of confrontation between the disinherited, the oppressed, the former colonial possessions. This is an era when the empire strikes back. And you have the opportunity to be a part of that striking back by voting for Julian Assange, a man that I know well and whom I visited in the Ecuadorian Embassy in London on Saturday to commemorate the first and I hope the last anniversary of his unjust incarceration in a small room, in a small embassy, in a small building next to Harrods in London where he can smell the croissant but cannot partake of it, at least not without sending someone out to buy one.
I know Julian Assange well, and I know that WikiLeaks, by delivering to us secrets which ought to belong to us, secrets of actions by governments which are elected and paid for by us, he delivered a signal service to humanity. And Edward Snowden, Edward J. Snowden, the J is important. It's the reason why the Hong Kong authorities had to allow him to pass. The Americans demanded the deportation of Edward J. Snowden, but they didn't explain what the J stood for. How could the Chinese know they'd got the right man? Could have been James, could have been John. Well, for me, it's Edward J. for Justice Snowden, who has revealed secrets to us which ought to belong to us. And that's why the United States scrambled the air forces of stooge European countries like Spain and Portugal and France and Italy, and the British would have done the same yesterday to bring to the ground the presidential airplane of Evo Morales. They're determined to catch Snowden as they're determined to catch Julian Assange so that they can zip up their mouths so that we never see or hear from them again and so we don't learn any further truths about the crimes of colonialism, imperialism in the world. You have the chance to influence that because Senator Julian Assange will be able freely to walk out of the Ecuadorian embassy, buy his croissant in Harrods, catch a plane to Sydney and appear here in Sydney Town Hall and tell you the truth. Now, I mentioned boats earlier. My wife and I took a walk down to the National Maritime Museum on our first day here in Sydney. We saw a boat, the Endeavour, on which then Lieutenant Cook arrived here on the King's mission. Then, as now, the British were speaking with forked tongue. They told the world they were here for an astronomical expedition. But no sooner had Lieutenant Cook arrived to quote the placard down there on the quay beside the HMS Endeavour, Captain Cook, and I quote, took possession of the western half of Australia in the name of George III. What a wonderful phrase, took possession. On behalf of this George, I thought about trying it in the Bunda jewelry across the road in the Hilton Hotel. I saw some beautiful jewels there. I thought about going in and telling the staff I was taking possession of this jewelry. But of course, if I had, I would have been arrested as a thief. Well, the taking possession of the western part of Australia was an act of theft, piracy, brigandry, and was an international crime. Not least because Captain Cook, as he became, didn't discover Australia at all. There were people already living in Australia who discovered it long before he arrived. And this organized crime of imperialism, which is all that imperialism is, a racket, racketeers, not the kind of small-time criminals that the Prime Minister Kevin Rudd announced today he was going to root out from his own party. They weren't dealing in packets of banknotes wrapped in brown paper. They were stealing entire countries and looting them of everything that they could steal from them. And in the case of the slave trade, even the people of those countries themselves. 
In my first meeting on Tuesday, I talked about that international crime of imperialism centered on two places, South Africa, now free, Palestine, still to be liberated. But one day, a Nelson Mandela, one day, a leading organization of the Palestinian people will enjoy freedom and victory as Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress did after their long and bitter struggle against apartheid in South Africa. But I said on Tuesday that I was going to bring that colonial story up to date and the news appears to have conspired to make this subject the most important subject in the world today, dominating all international news broadcasts all over the world. All eyes are on Tahrir Square in Cairo, in Egypt, where millions of people have just achieved a victory for mass popular power, poder popular, the people of Egypt have triumphed and bent events to their will. Of course, it's a complicated story, and I shall try to disentangle some of those knots for you. It's not black and white. Revolution is a process, not an event. It's not something that happens on one day and whose results you can instantly judge even in this age of media 24-7. But one thing has been demonstrated this day and yesterday and over the last 10 days in Egypt, and it is this. The people united can never be defeated. And when the people move in their millions, they can topple anybody any government, any king, any tyrant, any president. And that is a lesson that will be learned around the world. The truth is this, that the president, Mohamed Morsi of Egypt, was elected, yes, as president of his country, a signal achievement, no doubt, but he was elected on the crest of a revolutionary wave and he betrayed that revolution and that wave has now swept him away and those waters are still raging. He himself has conceded in the last few days that he made, and I quote him, many, many mistakes. I would add a few many's to that, many, 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 many mistakes he made. And I'm going to go through, as I have to, some of those. But I nonetheless think that a significant lesson has been dealt out by the Egyptian masses over the last 48 hours, and that is this, that the people cannot be ignored, that they are a factor in politics, domestic and international, as long as they themselves recognize that they are so and are prepared to act. More than 30 years ago, the Iranian people confronted the most brutal, giant tyrant, the Shah of Persia, who had the most fearsome torture apparatus, who had an army, legions of hundreds of thousands of soldiers armed to the teeth. But when the Iranian people moved in their millions, nothing could stop them. And the tyrant Shah of Persia was brought down and the Islamic revolution in Iran began and continues still. And that subject too, I shall have to refer to in the course of this talk on the second of my attempts 
to demonstrate, illustrate to the people of Australia what is going on in the Arab and Muslim world today. Mursi, as the presidential candidate of the Muslim Brotherhood, deserves respect because the Muslim Brotherhood suffered greatly over many decades of dictatorial rule in the era of Hosni Mubarak. Their leaders suffered long terms of imprisonment, torture, disappearance and murder, long exile. The Muslim Brotherhood is, in, is an important, significant, indispensable part of the polity of Egypt. But they cannot rule alone. And that's the first of the lessons that I believe have been delivered by events in Cairo today. In periods of transition, in revolutions, it's not enough to win an election by 51% to 49% and then pretend to yourself that you have the right to govern and rule exactly as only you see fit. And we warned President Morsi over and over again over this last year that he had to embrace other political forces in Egypt if the revolution was to thrive and if his presidency was to survive. But he ignored all of these entreaties. And I hope that on their reflection, as they must now begin to be doing, this political trend of the Muslim Brotherhood will understand that political Islam is an important strand of political thought in the Arab countries, but it is not the only one, and it cannot rule alone. And any attempt to do so will lead to the events that occurred in Cairo these last two days. Secondly, a movement like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which suffered so much at the hands of a dictatorship backed by the European settler colonial state of Israel and the United States of America itself ought to have known that when freed from the jailhouse and entering the president's house, the idea that he could govern hand in hand with the same colonial state of Israel and the imperial superpower of America was doomed because the interests of the mass of the Egyptian people are diametrically opposite to the interests of Israel and the United States of America. And so to attempt to rebuild Egypt on IMF and World Bank money and proscriptions, prescriptions was doomed. The attempt to continue to semi-blockade the Gaza Strip and keep the Palestinian people incarcerated in the most densely populated piece of earth on the land just to please Israel and just to continue with the Camp David agreements was doomed. If the Muslim Brotherhood means anything, it must mean brotherhood with the Palestinian people under siege in Gaza. Surely, surely. And the attempt, more than an attempt, of the many, 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 many mistakes that Morsi made. His declarations against Syria, itself the victim of a conspiracy launched by the very same Israel and the United States and its allies his eviction of the Syrian ambassador from Cairo, his decisive role in the expulsion of Syria from the League of Arab States, 
and above all his call for takfiri fanatic extremists in Egypt to go to Syria and join the attempt to rip Syria to shreds and pieces doomed his government from the moment that he made those remarks. Who knew, Mr. Morsi, as I must now address you, who knew that when you demanded the downfall of President Bashar al-Assad, that it would be you who would downfall long before any change of government in Syria. But of course, the events in Egypt are not black and white. There are many forces at play of whom we should beware and of whom we should be careful what we wish for. I have to tell you that when I see Muhammad al-Baradai and remember the role that he played when he could have stopped the imperialist invasion of Iraq but decided to please his bosses in the United States instead, when I see him on the platform with the generals today, it makes my blood run cold. I don't recognize him as speaking for the masses in Egypt, nor any of the falul, the remnants of the Mubarak dictatorship who are dancing with delight today. And I'm, of course, anxious about an army which is no longer the Arab army of the free officers of 1952 led by Colonel Nasser, but an army which is bought and paid for by the United States of America. That army should not be allowed to hold the reins of power in Egypt for one day more than is necessary to organize new parliamentary and presidential elections in Egypt. And any attempt by them to cling on to power, to rule from beyond the grave of Mubarak, should be resisted in the millions by the Egyptian people who have shown today and yesterday that they can do it if they try. It's important that we can see clearly. It's important that we know what's going on. I believe that a second thing which has been established today, and what timing, because I thought I was going to have to argue here that there is an Arab Spring, that there are Arab revolutions because I meet many people in the Arab world and the wider Muslim world who believe that these revolutions were somehow a conspiracy, somehow staged by some master chess player in London or in Washington. I caution you, never believe that the leaders of the imperial countries are James Bonds. They are more Austin Powers than James Bonds. They do not have the ability to move pieces around in the way that some imagine that they can. The Arab world was rotten to the core. The kings, the presidents, installed by imperialism in the Sykes-Picot countries I talked about on Tuesday night had to fall, must fall. There needs to be an Arab Spring. There needs to be Arab revolutions. And the Egyptian masses have shown what revolution can do. It's cleansing torrential potential to sweep away the old and sweep in the new. It's vitally necessary for us all to grasp that fact 
that nobody is pulling the strings of 10 million people in Egypt, in cities and towns, many of them we've never heard of before. And I assure you, William Hague, David Cameron, nor Barack Obama have ever heard of them either. These revolutions came out of the miserable reality that the Arab world found itself in and much of it is still in. As I described on Tuesday, it's worth repeating, an Arab world that stretches from the Atlantic Ocean to the Persian Gulf. 350 million Arabs speaking one language, worshipping one God with a common culture and overwhelmingly a common religion, but an absolute adherence to monotheism and the belief in that one God has the potential to be an international superpower. Imagine all that land from Marrakesh to Bahrain, all that water, all that oil, all that gas, all those people, all speaking that one language. If they were moving in the direction of unity and independence, Nobody in the world would be able to ignore the Arabs. Everybody in the world would have to take account of the, the wishes and the interests of the Arabs instead of the playground for imperial looting, which the Arab world has been for a century. At least for 100 years, the imperialists have divided in order to rule the Arabs, in order to steal their things. And they have looted much, maybe most, of the bounty which God gave to the Arabs under their soil and under their waters. So that hundreds of millions of Arabs are poor, whilst a tiny number are so filthy rich they have absolutely no idea what to do with their money. Spending it in the casinos and the bordellos and the arms bazaars and the property markets and the upmarket stores in London and Paris and New York and elsewhere, whilst Arabs go hungry and live stunted lives for lack of the opportunity which the investment of that money in their economy, in their society, could have provided them. But as long as the Arabs remain divided and weak, why should the West stop stealing their things? If you don't respect yourself in life, why should anyone else respect you? That's a key lesson which has to be learned. I have known many, many Arab leaders. Let me talk about one. I'm going to talk about many, but let me start with one who was, and I'm, I need to make this caveat, who was the best of the kings. I don't believe in kings myself, but if you're going to have kings, better that they're Sheikh Zayed of the UAE than some of the other kings who will not, I promise, remain nameless in the rest of my address. I once sat for five hours with Sheikh Zayed, the late Sheikh Zayed. He gave me a watch. I've still got it on. I declared it in the parliamentary register <laughs> for any journalists present. For five hours, he and I agreed on all of these things about the sanctions that were killing the Iraqi children, one every six minutes of every day and every night. We agreed about Palestine. We agreed about Arab unity. We agreed about the need to expel foreign military bases from the Arab lands and many, many other things. I returned from Abu Dhabi to the British Parliament. I gave a speech to the now deceased uh, Minister for Middle Eastern Affairs, uh, Mr. Fatchett, I told him, look, even your own friends in the Arab world 
agree with me on A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The minister rose. He said, when did you see Sheikh Zayed? I said, last Tuesday. He said, I saw him on Saturday. And he didn't say any of those things to me. And the minister wasn't lying. And I wasn't lying. It was Sheikh Zayed who was lying. He was ready to talk to me, but he wasn't ready to speak up in front of the Hawaja, the minister of the British crown. And he was the best of the kings. So imagine what the worst of them are like. That's the melancholy truth. As long as the Arabs are led by such forked-tongued people who will hold their tongue in the presence of what they imagine to be their betters. Why should the West stop robbing you? If you don't make them pay a price, a proper price, a financial price, a political price, a price in respect, for dealing with you, why should they offer you any? If the jewelry I was talking about in uh, Bunda was being given away free, why would anyone pay for it? And as long as the Arabs are giving away, either through controlling the supply of oil according to the dictates of Western markets, the price of oil, ditto, as long as the Arabs exact no political conditions or price, as long as the Arabs don't even ask for respect, why should Western governments offer them any? That's just a fact of life. Now, of course, that pattern of potentates and kings and tyrants could not last forever. It was beginning, Sykes-Pico, and for the people who are not from the Arab world that are in the audience, let me take a moment to describe who Sykes and Pico were. A French and an English politician in the case of Sykes and foreign affairs official from the Quai d'Orsay in the case of Picot sat in the building in which I sit and have done for 26 years. Every day for 26 years I have had to walk past a room in which a Frenchman and an Englishman sat with their maps and their pencils and their slide rules and invented what we now know as the Arab world. They broke it into wholly artificial states. They even chose kings to put on the thrones of those states they were creating. Sykes and Picot thought their project might last 20 to 30 years as new documents have shown. If you had told them that a hundred years later, Arabs would be ready to fight each other over flags and borders and states which a Frenchman and an Englishman invented for them, they would have laughed at the very idea. They imagined that the Arabs' desire to come together as one people would in the end be unstoppable. They were only looking for a break, for a period in which they could rob you and put down as many roots as well as oil wells that they could. But that 100 years, designed by Sykes and Pico, has been a century of absolute misery for the Arabs, at least most of them, with no influence over international events regularly invaded and occupied 
when indirect occupation would no longer do. The most foul and corrupt regimes propped up and supported endlessly by the governments that succeeded Sykes and Picot and joined, of course, by the superpower, the United States of America. During that time, they have really parted on your account. Not only do they get the oil and the gas at the price and the pace they dictate, they insist that the rulers of the Arab world invest the petrodollars they pay them in Western economies and Western arms industries and the like. But that began just in the last few years to be insecure. They feared the rise of political Islam. They thought that organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood might have revolutionary potential which might bring them to power, topple the kings and the presidents and the tyrants and change things for the better. So they determined upon a new course which I describe as Sykes-Picot II. Sykes-Picot II is so bad that the day might come when we look back on Sykes-Picot I with nostalgia. We might wish to be back in the day when there were 23 Arab countries instead of 123 or 523. Not countries, but emirates divided into little statelets based on sect or confession or ethnicity, all armed and facing each other rather than facing out at those who exploit them. Don't think it's fanciful. Some people say to me, well, how could they partition Arab countries? It would require the mass movement of people, maybe millions of people, from one zone to another zone. Don't think that that is beyond them. And study the fate of the millions who perished and whose lives were disfigured, some forever after, by the partition of the Indian subcontinent the creation of India and Pakistan, and then later Bangladesh and Pakistan, and the mass death toll and misery that those partitions required. Actually, partitioning the Arab world on a sectarian basis would be chicken feed compared to the partition of the Indian subcontinent, almost one billion people. The partition would look something like this. In Lebanon and Syria, indeed Lebanon and Syria would cease to exist. And there would be a Druze emirate, Christian emirates, Sunni Muslim emirates, Shia Muslim emirates, Kurdish emirates, how many is that? That's five or six or seven already in what is now two countries. Alawain, another. There are actually 23 religions in Syria alone. Think of the endless potential for sowing so much sectarian and ethnic hatred amongst the people that it no longer became tenable for them to live together in one state or even in two states in the case of Syria and Lebanon, which are artificial creations in any case. I met a man of 93 called Professor Dabas in Jordan. High on a mountain we sat. We looked around us at these countries that Sykes and Picot had created. I asked him, when you were young, there was nothing called Jordan. There was no country called Lebanon. What did you call yourself when you were young? He thought for a minute. 
And he shrugged and he said, we were Arabs from Bilad Sham. Now, that's what the Arabs in Bilad Sham should think that they are all Arabs in the land of Sham. But do they think so now? Will they think so? If the poison of Sykes-Picot II courses through their veins for long enough and destroys any conception of Arabness amongst them. The imperialists working on this Sykes Picot 2 plan believe not. They believe that just as it was possible to make a Lebanese believe he was different from a Syrian, so different he was ready to die to accept that difference, can easily be persuaded that he's not a Lebanese at all. He's a Sunni and has nothing to do with a Christian or a Shiite or a Druze even in his own country of Lebanon. They believe that this can be done. And there are some signs that they are right. I love Lebanon. I entered the Arab world through Lebanon in 1977. It's my favorite Arab country. But you know this, when I hear Western governments talking about Lebanese democracy, I always have to point out to them that actually, if there was democracy in Lebanon, it would be President Syed Hassan Nasrallah who would be governing the country. Well, it would be. Well, think about it. It would be. The majority, the great majority of the people of Lebanon would vote for Syed Hassan. He would be the president, but he can't be the president. No Muslim can be the president because of a constitution drawn up specifically to avoid it and based on a census older than the oldest man still alive in Lebanon. And Syed Hassan's not complaining about that, by the way. In fact, the rest are all very lucky that Hassan Nasrallah has the wisdom not to wish to open sectarian wounds in Lebanon. They say that Hezbollah went to Qusayr to join the battle in Syria for sectarian reasons. If Hezbollah were interested in sectarianism, they could take over Lebanon in an afternoon. In an afternoon. But they have no interest in taking over Lebanon. It's precisely because they're against sectarianism that they entered the battle in Qusayr. Hezbollah were the last foreign force to arrive in Syria, not the first. And if the other foreign forces will leave Syria, Hezbollah would be delighted to leave Syria also. It's because they're not sectarian, because they don't want to see the triumph of sectarianism in Syria, that the Hezbollah fighters finally had to enter that battle. Because Syed Hassan has more wisdom than those who are playing these sectarian games and what games they are. The Syrian people are not Saudis. They're not Afghans. They will never, ever, ever accept to be ruled by Al-Qaeda and their barbaric, obscurantist interpretations of Islam. Never. Who brought these Takfiri fanatics to Syria from Chechnya, from Libya, from the Netherlands, from England, 
From all over the world, these people have descended upon the people of Syria like vultures. They have descended. Who brought them? Who's paying for them? Every one of us here in this room knows that. But talk about playing with fire. I asked David Cameron in Parliament just a few months ago if he would describe the differences, just the key differences between the hand-chopping, throat-cutting fanatics we would gone to Mali to kill and the hand-chopping, throat-cutting fanatics we were giving money and weapons to kill in Syria. Give us the difference. Explain to us the difference. Imagine the United States of America in bed with Al-Qaeda. The same Al-Qaeda, they say, murdered 3,000 of their people in front of our eyes in those Twin Towers, in that act of mass murder on 9-11, 2001. Talk about a short memory. How can you now be in an alliance with people who murdered thousands of your citizens. What, what's so bad about Bashar al-Assad that you have to become an ally of Osama bin Laden's people in order to destroy him? Let me tell you what's so bad about him. It's not because the Assad family enjoys one family rule. The West loves one family rule. One family in Arabia has even stamped the name of its family on the name of the country. Even Kim Jong-il didn't call North Korea Kim Jong-ilia. <laughs> but the Al Saud family have put their family name on the door of one of the most important Arab countries of them all. So they can't be against Bashar because they don't like one family rule. When the Emir of Qatar did exactly like Kim Jong-il, as it happens, hand over absolute power in a dictatorship to his younger son, missing the elders. When it happened in North Korea, the Western media couldn't stop laughing. When it happened in Qatar, they were on the airplane to go and kiss the nose and the backside of the king of Qatar to congratulate them on their wisdom. Smooth, transi tr smooth transition, they said. Well, how rough could it be? The father gave the keys to his son. He said, you're in charge now, but I'm going to be the emir father, just in case you need to consult me on anything. No wonder it was a smooth transition. So it cannot be because of one family rule in Syria. It cannot be because they cannot tolerate dictatorships in the Arab world because virtually all of the Arab countries are dictatorships and their best friends are the most dictatorial dictatorships of them all. It cannot be because there's not human rights and liberty in Syria because there's no human rights or liberty in the Arab countries to whom or to which they are closest. They are determined to destroy Bashar al-Assad, not for any bad things that the regime in Damascus have done, and they have done bad things. They are de determined to destroy Bashar because of the good things, because Bashar will not bow the knee and surrender Syrian territory to Israel. That's why they hate him so. 
if he would sign a peace treaty surrendering the Golan to the settler state of Israel, they could forget all these other things. But he refuses to do so. Moreover, he told the Palestinian resistance, yes, you can live here in Damascus. We will feed you. We will arm you. We will finance you. We will protect you. And look how they have been betrayed by some elements of the Palestinian resistance in return. He told, he told the Palestinian refugees in Yarmouk and the other camps, we might be poor here in Syria, but you will not be poorer than us. We have schools, we have hospitals, we have universities, we have sports and culture facilities, and you have exactly the same right to enjoy them as any Syrian has the right to enjoy them. You know any other Arab countries where the Palestinian refugees live exactly the same as the citizens of that country? No, you don't, because there are none. They hate Bashar because he refuses to break relations with the Lebanese National Islamic Resistance, Hezbollah, which defeated Israel on the battlefield. The only, the only, only Arab army ever to defeat Israel on the battlefield. He refuses to break with them. He refuses to play the imperial game of further isolating and weakening Iran. Why should Iran be treated in this way? Asks Bashar. They don't have any nuclear weapons, but Israel has hundreds of nuclear weapons. Why don't you sanction Israel for the nuclear weapons it's got rather than sanction Iran for nuclear weapons it doesn't have. When did Iran last invade anybody else's country? Iran hasn't invaded any other country for more than 400 years. I wish I could say that about my country. Don't you? Iran has done nothing to deserve the international ostracism, isolation, sanction, and threat which it faces. So why should Bashar go along with it? He's telling the truth, the others are lying. They say that Iran is intent on the sectarianization of the Arabs. How can that be? As the chair in her gracious introduction pointed out, I myself broke the siege on Gaza over and over again over these last few years. Iran has been supporting the Palestinian people in Gaza with everything that they need, and there's not a single Shia in Gaza, not a single one. So Bashar refuses these things, and that's why they are determined to destroy him. Still I see on websites and on Twitter and so on, these absurd fantasy talk that Israel and America somehow want Bashar to survive. That'll be why Senators John McCain and Senator Lieberman and Lindsey Graham and all of Israel's biggest supporters have been driving American policy into support for the Syrian rebels 
from the start. It's absurd. Do you think Israel wants Bashar to fall so that a more anti-Israel government can emerge in Damascus? Do you think that America wants Bashar out so that a government more just to the Arab cause can take its place? You'd have to be a lunatic to believe that. Yet some do. And some of the people that used to throw flowers at me, calling me a hero for breaking the siege on Gaza, will now denounce what I'm saying here this evening. And I say this to them. What I'm saying today, I said two years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, and as long as God gives me breath, I'll be saying exactly the same thing on any platform that I can muster. And now these people are based in some of the countries who have betrayed the Arabs and the Palestinians most. I hope there is change coming in Qatar. For all I've said, I hope the son turns out to be better than his father in Qatar. But Qatar is very, very, very small. It's more a petrol station than a country. <laughs> Qatar can never, will never be the leader of the Arabs. How could it possibly be? And it's important to know your weight, your size in life. You can hope to grow a little bit taller. You can hope to be a little bit stronger. But a dwarf will never be a giant. And I hope that we can look forward to a change. But what I know is this, is that the Emir of Qatar goes shopping in Tel Aviv whilst Holy Jerusalem is occupied by foreign soldiers from the same state of Israel. I know that the King of Jordan goes shopping in Tel Aviv. I know that the King of Jordan has a treaty, open treaty, with Israel. I once said to one of these would-be jihadists, if you're so desperate for a jihad, can't you choose one of the Arab states that have betrayed everybody and are openly belly dancing for the enemy? Can't you have a jihad there rather than in Syria? And answer came there none. I know that these people who are never done telling us how Muslim they are, how Islamic they are, have not been able to lift a single finger to come to the rescue of Al-Aqsa in Holy Jerusalem. I know that they have not, and I know that they will not. And we need an Arab revolution which places the liberation of Palestine right at the center, the heart of the Arab revolution. How can you have an Arab revolution as long as the Palestinian people remain prisoners of foreign occupation? by settlers who came from overseas and took their land. The battle, however, has turned. The tide has turned in Syria. The government in Damascus is not going to fall. But we will have... Be sure, be sure about that that however many hand-held shoulder missiles, however many knives to cut people's chests open to eat their hearts, Western governments give these people, no matter how many bishops and priests they behead, no matter how much money bankrupt Britain 
which can't pay its electricity bills, which has millions of people unemployed, mass poverty stalking the land, but can find hundreds of millions of pounds to give to others to destroy Arab countries, no matter how much of that they do. The tide has turned. Syria has won the war. Syria will never capitulate and will never surrender. And if I'm right, then we may have stopped Sykes-Picot II in its tracks. They have other plans elsewhere, even in Saudi Arabia itself. I began to be suspicious a couple of years ago when British politicians whom I knew knew nothing about Arabia would come up to me and opine that, well, Saudi Arabia is not really one country, is it? There's Najd, there is Hijaz, there is Mecca, there is the Eastern Province. I knew then that they were beginning to think that even Saudi Arabia itself might need to be partitioned if the going got rough enough. But I like to think that just as Stalingrad was the turning point of the Second World War, when the hordes surrounded the city in their hundreds of thousands and starved the people so that they ate every rat, every dog, every horse in the city, some reduced even to eating their own dead. Just as the Nazi hordes thought that they could choke the life out of the then Soviet Union by winning the Battle of Stalingrad, so this battle to defend Syria will prove a turning point for the Arabs. I believe that it can be so. I believe in the Arabs more than the Arabs believe in themselves. And they have to find a way to break out of this malaise of waiting for the foreigner to tell them what to do, to organize what's going to happen in their countries. And I believe that they can do it. Because there are many bad Arabs, and I've met most of them. There's one called Fuad Senora. I remember him well. For 20 years I knew him. And then in 2006, I turned up at his office one or two days after the Israeli surrender to the Hezbollah forces in 2006. I had been on many television programs. The chair referred to one of the most celebrated on Sky News, where I said that Hezbollah were giving Israel a bloody good hiding on the screen that I could see. I went into his office that baking August of 2006, before I even sat down, this man I'd known for 20 years shouted at me from behind his desk, stop saying we won the war. We didn't win the war. I said, Prime Minister, I've known many Arab leaders that lost wars and claim they won them. You're the first Arab leader to win a war and claim that you lost one. And of course, he had to claim that he lost it because he didn't want to enjoy the prestige that the Lebanese resistance then basked in virtually universally across all of the Arab world and much of the rest of the world also, at least amongst those who love liberty. It was a baking hot day. He kept us for one hour without offering tea, without offering coffee, 
without offering a glass of water even. My colleague, Man Bashur, is quite a big man, was sweating profusely, but not a tissue or a glass of water was forth. Even in the Mohayam, in the camp, you're given a glass of water, followed by a cup of tea, then a cup of coffee. The families are scurrying around to collect the cups and saucers. They wouldn't dream of having a guest amongst them and treat them in the way that Senora uh, treated us. He's not, of course, the worst. That day that he cried is one that we'll never forget. Or when he kissed Condoleezza <laughs> and when the Arabs around the world shouted, give him a visa, Condoleezza, give him a visa and take him to your heart. I've known many bad Arabs. Trust me on that. I don't want to go further down that road. It's too personal. I've known many bad Arabs. And I've known many apathetic Arabs who had lost their way, lost their religion, lost their faith, lost their confidence in themselves. But I'll tell you this, some of the best people that I have ever met are Arabs. And it's important the Arabs focus on them as their role models. The children of the Palestinian Intifada are Arabs. The young men of the Iraqi resistance to American British invasion and occupation were Arabs. Hezbollah are Arabs. Arabs can do it if they are united, if they have leadership, if they have faith in themselves and in God. The Arab world can be transformed. It takes in the desert just a few drops of rain to transform the landscape. I believe that the events now occurring notwithstanding hiccups and setbacks in this Arab Spring. These are drops of rain that will transform the landscape. And the most beautiful garden of them all will bloom in Damascus as the enemy is driven from the land. Wassalamu alaikum. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.